So welcome back. This is going to be our very first screencast for chapter 7 and we're going to be looking at cells as we make our way through this chapter. And we're going to take chapter 7 and actually break it down into three sections. In this very first section we're going to be looking at cell history. Uh, we're also going to look at the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And I'm also going to give you a little bit of information about microscopes. 7.2 is going to focus on cell structure and 7.3 is going to focus on cell transport. <coughs> So looking at this first slide, you're going to notice we have two individuals. Uh, the person towards the top, his name is Robert Hook, and the person towards the bottom, his name is Anton Van Leeuwenhoek. Now they're both pretty significant when it comes down to cell history because they were one of the first scientists to actually look at things that normally could not be seen with the naked eye. Now in Hook's case, he used something called a compound microscope. Now it's compound because it uses two lenses. One lens is going to be found in the eyepiece, and the second is going to be found in the objective. So both of those lenses working together help to create that virtual image of whatever you were looking at. Now, he was also pretty amazing because he actually was the one who came up with the word cells. And he did this after making observations of very thin slices of cork. If you notice over here on the right-hand side, cork itself is made up of lots and lots of very tiny chambers. Well, during the mid-1600s, um, monasteries were pretty prevalent and in those monasteries you had these super tiny rooms and these tiny rooms were called cells and so he made a comparison between the monasteries and what he saw when he looked through the microscope at this cork tissue and he decided to use the term cells. Now Leeuwenhoek on the other hand instead of using a compound scope he actually used a single lens microscope but he was pretty famous because he was the one who actually was the first person to actually see tiny living things. So things that, again, you normally wouldn't be able to see in pond water, his microscope was able to bring those things into view. So that made him pretty significant. So again, make sure that you know some information about each of these individuals as we make our way through chapter 7. So based on the observations that were made by Robert Hooke, Leeuwenhoek, and actually lots of scientists from the 17 to 1800s, we created something called the cell theory. Now the cell theory states three things. The first one is all living things are made up of cells, regardless of what it is. If it's a plant, if it's an animal, if it's a fungus, if it's a bacteria, it's made up of cells. Number two, cells are the basic units of structure and function in all living things. And the last one, new cells are produced from existing cells, basically meaning that cells do reproduce. So what we need to do next is we need to look at the type of microscope you guys will be using in the classroom. You're going to be using something called a light microscope. Now it can also be called a compound microscope. Now again it's compound because it actually uses two lenses to form the image. Now the first set of lenses is going to be located just above the specimen. So in the objective right here you're going to see that first set of lenses. And that first set is going to be used to produce an enlarged image of the specimen. And so that's what you're going to see here. The second set of lenses is going to magnify that image even more. And that second set of lenses is going to be located right here in the eyepiece. So those two lenses working together will actually produce what you see down here. So that's a, that enlarged virtual image of whatever you happen to be looking at. So when it comes down to using light microscopes, sometimes it's really difficult to see certain specimens because those specimens are almost transparent. So what we need to do is we need to add either a stain or we need to add a dye. And if you look on the lower left of your screen, you're going to notice we have an example of a group of cells, and these are cheek cells. And these cheek cells have actually been stained with iodine. And before staining those cells with iodine, it was really difficult to see those cells. In fact, you really couldn't see anything, but after the staining of the iodine, you're going to notice it brought out the cell membrane, and it definitely brought out the nucleus in some of our cells. So it really made those cell parts stick out. Now on the right-hand side, this is another example of cheek cells. The magnification isn't quite as strong, but we're using a different type of stain. So in this case, we're using methylene blue. And what's really neat about stains and dyes is sometimes you can stain only specific cell parts which really makes them pop when you're making cell observations. So stains and dyes can be really important. 
So now that we've looked at light microscopes, what we want to do next is we want to compare the light microscope to what we call electron microscopes. And off to the right hand side you're going to see two images. Both of these were created using electron microscopes. So the maximum magnification that you might see using a light microscope is probably about a thousand times. The magnification that you could expect from an electron microscope you're looking at millions of times. So the amount of detail that you would be able to see is pretty significant. So we have two types of microscopes. We have one called a TEM, or a transmission electron microscope, and one called an SEM, or a scanning electron microscope. Both of them are going to use electrons to produce an image, and that image will most likely be viewed using some sort of computer screen. Um, when you're talking about a TEM, you're talking about producing a flat, two-dimensional image and oftentimes we call these images micrographs. If it's a scanning electron microscope what you're probably going to end up seeing is a scan of the surface of the specimen that you're looking at. You probably will not see the innards or the insides of the specimen but you get a good view of the outside and this one's going to produce a 3D image of your specimen. So these are both pretty large microscopes but they give us lots of detail of what we're looking at. So next what we need to do is we need to look at um, some information that's going to help you distinguish between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Now most cells are going to range in size from about 5 to about 50 micrometers. Now some of you may not understand what a micrometer is. Well to give you sort of an idea, uh, 1,000 micrometers is going to equal actually 1 millimeter. Right? And so if you look here, the smallest bacteria are about 0.2 micrometers across, while the largest amoebas are going to be about 1,000 micrometers across. And that's going to equal, again, 1 millimeter. So that's a pretty big cell. Now down here in this chart, this chart's pretty significant because what it does is it kind of gives you an idea what could you see based on the type of microscope that you're using. If you're using a typical light microscope, remember the maximum magnification for that type of scope is probably about a thousand times for most of those scopes. And if you look here, you would be able to see anything from about a millimeter on down to maybe about one micrometer and that's what this refers to. It's referring to micrometer. So maybe some of the largest bacteria. Now if you're using an electron microscope you have a much better range. You can definitely see some of the largest cells, the plants, the animals, but you could also see some of the smallest molecules. So those electron microscopes allow you to see lots of different things. Now when you're talking about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, um, despite the differences between these two types of cells, all cells regardless of the type are all going to contain DNA and all cells, again regardless of the type, are going to contain a thin flexible barrier called a cell membrane. <clears throat> so for our final slide what we need to do is we need to make sure that you can distinguish between a prokaryotic and a eukaryotic cell. Now there's some pretty significant differences between the two. Uh, the first one definitely being size. Prokaryotic cells are very small and eukaryotic cells are pretty large in comparison. Now something else that you'll notice about um, prokaryotic cells is they do not enclose their DNA in a nucleus. And so on the right hand side when we talk about a eukaryotic cell you can see the nucleus located here in the animal cell and here in the plant cell. You don't find a nucleus over here in the prokaryotic cell. Again the DNA simply floats throughout the cytoplasm. Now again as we said before eukaryotic cells are rather large they definitely are very complex. They have lots of different cell parts as you can see here. Now those cell parts, we give them a special name. They're called organelles. Right? And in fact there's many eukaryotes out there that actually are highly specialized to perform certain functions for the organism that they might be found in. Now again there are many types of eukaryotes. You can find eukaryotic cells in plants. You definitely find them in animals. They can be found in fungus. And there are some eukaryotic cells out there that can actually exist alone. And so these are called protists or protozoans. And so they're considered single-celled creatures. So that's going to finish up our very first screencast for Chapter 7. Again, do not forget to finish up your screencast notes before you come to class.